I always just been a fan of anything coming out of Memphis. When I was hustling, I always was playing Memphis rappers. I felt like they had such an underground scene, and that's what I that's what I gravitated to. Like the most gutter music is what I want to hear. All the sound came from us, you know, the whole crump thing and all that came from us. They were the first people like 36 Mafia and Lord Infamous and there would be no ASAP Rocky, no Migos, no Future, no nothing. Memphis could easily have the most underrated rap scene in history. When people mention the top cities, places like New York, Chicago, Atlanta, and LA are usually mentioned and Memphis is often forgotten. But the city has had a strong rap scene since the 90s and in every era since the early 2000s they've had at least one group or rapper who's either been an underground or mainstream superstar. The city is also responsible for pioneering a large amount of elements in today's music. Many of today's rappers and producers have a lot of respect for the city and the majority of listeners of current music have heard at least one song that sampled an old Memphis artist. In recent years, the city has been getting record amounts of mainstream attention, but the majority of people are still ignorant to just how impactful Memphis has been. So in this video, we'll take a look at the story of Memphis. Quick reminder before we get started, these videos take a lot of time and effort, so if y'all could subscribe, that would be greatly appreciated. Alright, let's get into it. Hip hop originated in the 70s in New York, but it didn't really reach Memphis until the end of the 80s. The man most credited as the originator of the Memphis hip hop scene is DJ Spanish Fly. He made a name for himself in the late 80s, DJing and putting together mixtape compilations of the hottest rappers out at the time, and he was the most influential figure in the Memphis music scene. Like every other city, Memphis had its own unique trends, and around this time, the youth had a dance they did where they would hop around and wave their arms, and this was called getting buck. And the dance was extremely popular in the city through the 80s and 90s. Spanish Fly inspired another dance after he dropped the song called Gangsta Walk, which ended up becoming a phenomenon in the clubs after the kids created a dance similar to getting buck, where they went around in circles instead of just hopping around. Because it was inspired by Spanish Fly's song, they called the dance Gangsta Walking. Dances were very important in early Memphis hip hop culture, and these early dances would evolve into Memphis Shookin as time progressed. Spanish Fly got things started, and in the late 80s, one of the first rappers to see success in the early years was Gangsta Pat. He dropped his first album, Number One Suspect, in 1990, and this was the first commercial rap release in Memphis history. This was the early period before Memphis established its sound, so Gangsta Pat's music was heavily West Coast influenced. Two other rappers on the early Memphis scene were 8Ball and MJG. They hit the scene and made a name in 1991, dropping their debut mixtape, Listen to the Lyrics. Throughout the early 90s, more artists continued to come out, but the DJs were also a crucial part of the new scene. DJ Squeaky was the next big DJ, and producer in the city after Spanish Fly. Then a few years later, there was DJ Zert. Then DJ Paul and Juicy J. The DJs worked clubs, put out their own mixes of popular records, made beats, and some of them rapped as well. Other rappers to come out in the early 90s included names like Kingpin Skinny Pimp, Al Capone, Tommy Wright III, Criminal Man, and Lord Infamous. In 1992, Skinny Pimp dropped Pimps and Robbers, and in 1993, Al Capone dropped Street Knowledge, both of which are considered to be classic Memphis mixtapes, but still clearly West Coast influence. The new Memphis sound was just beginning to emerge around this time. As far as production, most hip hop historians credit Squeaky and Zerk for coming up with the new sound. Their production choices included slower tempos in the popular East Coast sound at the time, 808s, occasional double and triple time hi-hats, hi-hat rolls, as well as dark and ominous melodies, sometimes created by looping horror movie soundtracks, and everything was made with lower end machines that gave the sound a grimy, low quality underground feel. This sound was different from the music T.I., Gucci, and Jeezy popularized as trap in the 2000s, but most of the popular elements that are used to define trap today, like 808s and double time hi-hats with rolls, 
were present in his early 90s Memphis sound, so many recognize it as the first trap music. In 1993, DJ Zerk dropped a song called Too Thick that really embodies the core elements of this new Memphis sound and is one of the most frequently sampled songs from the time. Also in 93, Tommy Wright III dropped a tape called The Memphis Massacre, another example of the new sound popping off at the time. In addition to these artists, DJ Paul and Lord Infamous, who were only 16 at the time, dropped a project called Come With Me To Hell, which is another example of this new sound. Here's what some songs on these projects sounded like. This same year, A-Ball and MJG made their official debut dropping their first album, Coming Out Hard. The project had elements of the new Memphis sound, but was more influenced by the West Coast and Houston. The duo would go on to be some of the most successful and well-known rappers from Memphis during this time, while more underground rappers popularized the new Memphis sound Zerk and Squeaky had been cooking up. As far as rapping styles for the new sound, the triplet flow began to emerge and gain popularity, and this would become a staple in Memphis rap. Sometimes I be wanting to take my fist and beat these bitches back. Think these bitches be making more gas than motherfucking Milton Bradley. Although it was in several cities around this time, and it's unclear who started it. In addition to the triplet flow, chance became a big part of the new sound, and many artists even went as far as to sample vocals from others to loop and create new choruses. And to this day, producers are still sampling vocals from old Memphis rappers. Yeah, life. Life is the only thing. By 1993, DJ Paul and Lord Infamous had dropped their first two mixtapes in high school and quickly built a buzz in the city but they ended up getting into a beef with DJ Squeaky and DJ Zerk because these two didn't like the fact that Paul was making beats using their sound and this led DJ Paul to drop a diss song called DJ Squeaky. The beef was never squashed and became an early example of Memphis rappers not getting along. Despite the beef, DJ Paul and Lord Infamous continued to gain popularity in the city. They ended up meeting another DJ who also produced and rap like DJ Paul and his name was Juicy J and the three teamed up to form a collective called Triple Six Mafia. In the following years, they added three more members, Koopsta, Crunchy Black, and Gangsta Boo, and changed their name again to Three Six Mafia. They put out their first release as a group in 1995 when they dropped Mystic Styles. Three Six embraced the dark Memphis sound that had been developing, but their subject matter made them different from a lot of other rappers. They were early examples of the phenomena of rappers acting like rock stars. They experimented with coke and other hard substances, and they weren't afraid to rap about it in their music. On top of this, they made constant satanic references in their early years. And they were so into the topic that their original name, Triple Six Mafia, was even a reflection of their attraction to playing with the subject. They would eventually move away from the satanic rap, but in the early years, their choice to lean into the world of rock stars resulted in them building a more diverse fan base than the average rapper. So in the mid 90s, 36 Mafia and others were just getting started, but 8Ball and JG were at the top of their careers and putting on for Memphis and the whole South. In 1995, they dropped their highest selling album on top of the world, with arguably their biggest song of all time, Space Age Pimpin'. They were at a level no Southern artists, except for maybe Ghetto Boys and 2 Live Crew, had reached prior to them. And they even had people like Diddy reaching out for features from them for his artists. Another Memphis artist signed to the same label and closely associated with 8 Ball MJG was Tila. Tila dropped his debut album Peace of Mind in 1996. And on this album, there was a song called Show Up featuring 8 Ball MJG that ended up blowing up to become one of the biggest songs in both of their catalogs to this day. Tila would continue doing his thing as one of the many Memphis rappers carrying the torch at the time. Meanwhile, more artists were continuing to pop up on the scene. Gangsta Black and Play a Fly were rappers from an area in Memphis called South Parkway. And around the mid 90s, they began their careers. Initially, they were associated with 3-6 Mafia and collaborated with them frequently on songs. 
Gangsta Black's debut mixtape, Breaking the Law, was exclusively produced by DJ Paul, and it did well and generated a lot of buzz. But early on, Player Fly ended up falling out with the group, and by the time he put out his debut album, Just Getting It On, they were on bad terms. So on the album, Fly dissed them on a song called Triple B Mafia. This was a big song for him, and the album had others like Getting It On and Just Awake and Shaken that also became big records. Despite being good friends with Player Fly, Gangsta Black was still on good terms with them, and in 1996, he dropped his second project, executively produced by Paul and Juicy, titled Can It Be? And it was successful as well, and to this day, it's considered to be arguably his best project. However, after this project, Gangsta Black would end up falling out with 36 Mafia as well, and separating to do his own thing. This whole time, 36 Mafia was still establishing themselves as a group. Following their debut album, the Mafia continued to put out good music consistently and grow their fame. In 1996, Juicy J's older brother Project Pat came home from a bid and started his rap career, appearing on 36 Mafia's 1996 album, The End. And in the following years, he would be tightly associated with them. But 36 Mafia were more like rock stars and appealed to wider spread audiences, while Pat was more like a voice for the gangsters, and he would go on to become an icon in hoods across the South and beyond. Throughout the late 90s, 36 dropped big songs like Tear the Club Up, Where's the Bud, and Late Night Tip. Tear the Club Up was a huge record and ended up becoming an anthem in Memphis. In 1997, they ended up signing a record deal. And with this added push, Tear the Club Up became an even bigger record and made its way across the country, even reaching places Memphis rap didn't usually make it, like New York. Tear the Club Up and other 3-6 Mafia club anthems was the origin of crunk music and directly inspired Lil Jon and the Eastside Boys, Crime Mob, and all the crunk music in Atlanta that took off in the early 2000s. Through the late 90s, the 3-6 Mafia hype continued to grow, but smaller artists on the Memphis scene were rising as well. In 1998, Player Fly dropped the album called Moving On, and on this album there was a record called Nobody Needs Nobody, which took off and became the biggest track of his career, and a song so beloved that some in the city call it the Memphis Anthem. In 1999, Gangsta Black released the album called 74 Minutes of Bump, with the track called South Parkway that would end up becoming one of the biggest hits of his career. Also in the late 90s, another legendary Memphis artist began his career. Lil Yo, who would later change his name to Yo Gotti, dropped his debut mixtape, Youngsters on the Come Up, in 1996 at the age of 15. Skinny Pimp recognized his talent early on and worked with him producing and recording some of his early songs. Through the late 90s, Yo Gotti continued to build a buzz in the city, preparing for his turn to take over. In 2000, 3-6 Mafia really started to gain serious mainstream attention when they teamed up with Project Pat and UGK to drop Sippin' on some Scissor. The song took off and became a huge hit, bringing the group mainstream attention and earning them their first platinum album. At the same time, Project Pat was also seeing his career take off. In 1999, he had dropped his debut album, Getty Green, which was well received by fans. Then in 2000, he was featured on the previously mentioned breakout hit, Sippin' on Some Scissor. And in 2001, he dropped another album titled Miss It Don't Play with the hit single, Chicken Head, that blew up to become his biggest song ever. He also had another big track called The Life We Live, and the album was very successful, reaching Billboard Top 200, and to this day is a classic. Pat was at the top of his career, but unfortunately, he was arrested on weapons charges violating his parole and would have to serve four years in prison. Meanwhile, 3-6 Mafia was continuing to go up. In 2003, they dropped another album called The Unbreakables with another big song called Riding Spinners that took off. This same year, Gangsta Boo walked away from the group. She was the second to leave after Koopsta, but although 3-6 Mafia was losing members, Juicy J and DJ Paul had created an imprint label called Hypnotized Minds, and through the early 2000s, they added members like Frasier Boy, LeChat, and Lil White, who would all see a fair amount of success in their own careers, as well as frequently collaborate with 3-6. Out of all these artists, Lil White would end up seeing the most success. After dropping the song called Oxycontin, they ended up blowing up and getting his name out. So the influence of 3-6 Mafia extended beyond the original group. But despite adding these new members to the imprint, 
3-6 would continue to lose core members and in 2005, Lord Infamous ended up going to jail and due to issues with him breaking contract, he had to temporarily separate from 3-6 Mafia, leaving only Juicy, Paul, and Crunchy during this time period. However, this was the year they would drop their biggest album ever. In September, they dropped the most known unknown and this album had a single called Stay Fly featuring Young Buck and A-Ball MJG. The record would end up being a smash hit and putting 3-6 Mafia on the mainstream audience's radar for the first time ever. The album also had another huge song featuring Project Pat called Poppin' My Collar. Propelled by these huge records, the album debuted at number 3 on the Billboard Top 200. Then, in 2006, the group ended up winning an Oscar for a song they did on the movie Hustle & Flow called Hard Out Here For A Pimp featuring Frasier Boy. So 11 years from their debut, 3-6 Mafia was finally mainstream, but 2006 was one of their final years. Crunchy Black ended up leaving the group, and Infamous was still unable to release music with them due to his contract violation. So in 2009, Paul and Juicy dropped the last project under the 3-6 Mafia name, titled Last Two Walk, and then went their separate ways. Throughout 3-6 Mafia's crazy run through the 2000s, Yo Gotti was steadily releasing music and preparing to go on a run of his own. In 2000 and 2001, his albums From the Dope Game to the Rap Game and Self Explanatory had taken off in the city, and in 2003, he had signed a record deal and dropped his first commercial release, Life, which included features like Lil Jon and the Eastside Boys, A Ball and JG, and Skinny Pimp. Then, in 2006, he dropped Back to the Basics, another solid project. Gotti didn't have any extremely mainstream hits or albums during this period, but he continued dropping classic mixtapes and solidifying himself as a top artist in Memphis. An important producer who Gotti worked with during these years was Drummer Boy. Around 2006, Drummer ended up producing some big songs for Gotti and getting his name out, leading to artists like Jeezy and Gucci Man reaching out to him, and as time went on, he established himself as one of the best producers on the scene and worked with the majority of the biggest rappers. Yo Gotti and 3-6 Mafia were the mainstream faces of Memphis through the 2000s, but there were other rappers making noise at the time. One of these rappers was Kia Shine. He had a buzz in the mid-2000s, then in 2007, he dropped a song called Crispy that ended up becoming a big hit. Around the late 2000s, the trend of Memphis rappers beefing was continuing to repeat because both Kia Shine and Yo Gotti would end up beefing with 3-6 Mafia. And Gotti even ended up dropping a diss record aimed at them called M-Town, causing Juicy J and Project Pat to respond on a song called F*** All Y'all. The beefs would carry on and these rappers would be on bad terms for a couple of years, but eventually they were able to resolve their problems. Going into the tens, a completely new wave was forming. A new rapper called Young Dolph had begun his career in 08 with his debut album Paper Route Campaign and through the early 10s he was the most consistent Memphis rapper dropping 13 mixtapes in the period from 2010 to 2014. By this time many Memphis artists had abandoned the distinct Memphis sound from the 90s and chose instead to rap on the early 10s Atlanta trap sound. But in the underground there was the 90s resurgence beginning. Down in Florida, an artist called Space Ghost Perp had created a group called Raider Clan and they were repopularizing the 90s Memphis sound for an entirely new generation. Two Memphis artists called Chris Travis and Xavier Wolf ended up joining the new wave releasing songs of their own on the old Memphis sound and they would also end up joining Raider Clan and collaborating frequently with them. The group would end up falling apart and Xavier Wolf and Chris Travis ended up leaving and forming their own group called Sesh Hollow Water Boys. They continued dropping individual projects and were some of the first to embrace SoundCloud when it was a brand new music platform. Around the mid 10s, they really began to take off. In late 2013, Chris dropped a song called Crunch Time that blew up into his biggest record ever, racking up millions of views on YouTube alone. Then in 2014, Xavier Wolf dropped a mixtape called Blood Short 2, which ended up containing some of his biggest songs like Thunder Man and Psycho 2. And he, along with Chris Travis and another rapper called Bones, teamed up on a song called We Don't Believe You, which also took off racking up a crazy amount of views. All of the motion they were seeing established Chris and Xavier as some of the top rappers in the underground, and what they were doing laid the foundation for the SoundCloud movement that would go mainstream in 2016. 
In addition to the 90s revival wave of Chris and Xavier and the mainstream trap wave of Dolph, another Memphis artist called Don Tripp was also getting shined through the late 2000s and early 10s with a more soulful style and attention to lyrics and telling stories. And he blew up off a song called Letter to My Son that embodied this approach to music. Through the 10s, he would collaborate with the Nashville artist called Starlito on a popular mixtape series called Step Brothers. Going into the mid-10s, Yo Gotti was still the biggest rapper in the city, and he was almost two decades into his career and just hitting his peak, dropping some of his biggest songs like Act Right, I Know, and Everybody. In 2013, he had formed his label Imprint CMG and signed a fellow Memphis artist called Zedzilla, but one of the biggest artists he ended up signing in these years was Snooty Wild. In 2013, Snooty Wild dropped a song called Yayo that blew up in Memphis. Gotti ended up hearing the song and signing Snooty to CMG. Then after signing, Snooty dropped the Yayo remix featuring Yo Gotti and another hit song called May Me and went on a mini run through 2014. In 2015, Gotti signed Black Youngster and towards the end of the year, Youngster began to take off with songs like Swear to God, CMG, and I Remember, as well as his viral antics on social media. In 2016, Gotti signed Moneybag Yo, and in October, they dropped a collab tape titled Two Federal with the big hit single called Gang Gang featuring Black Gangsta. From the early to mid 10s, Dolph had been seeing an increasing amount of success, and somewhere during this time, Yo Gotti had tried to sign him, but he had declined. According to him, this situation caused tension between the two, and soon they began taking subliminal shots at each other. Then in February, he dropped a mixtape called King of Memphis, which Gotti's camp was not happy about. The next month, Black Youngster made a diss track aimed at him called Shake Some, and a couple months later, Gotti dissed him subliminally on a record called Can't Do It. In 2017, Dolph responded with an extremely disrespectful song called Play With Your Bitch, where he said that Yo Gotti went from his biggest fan to his biggest hater, and he claimed to have slept with Gotti's girl in front of his big brother work, and got actors to play them and mock them in his video as well. Then, four days later, his car was shot a hundred times, and Black Youngster and two other CMG associates were arrested. The news went everywhere and caught the rap world's attention. Dolph capitalized on the situation, dropping a song called 100 Shots, which blew up and became one of his most successful songs. When Black Youngster was released in May, he took advantage of the new attention as well and shot a music video for his 2016 disc, Shake Some, then dropped the new Dolph disc titled Birthday, and both videos did millions. Then, in June, he dropped a song called Booty, which blew up into a huge mainstream hit and the biggest song of his career. He had another huge track from April called Hip Hopper that also took off in the summer, and the whole year he was red hot. 2017 was also a big year for Moneybag Yo. He and Gotti had dropped the video for a 2016 song called Doing Too Much, and it turned into a big hit running up tens of millions of views. He dropped his Federal Three Times album, as well as a collab album with NBA Youngboy, who was still very early in his career at the time. And between his hit singles and these new projects, Moneybag Yo was bigger than ever before and getting mainstream attention. So by 2017, the Memphis rap scene was the most mainstream it had ever been. But this was nothing compared to where it would go in the next couple of years when the city exploded onto the mainstream. And Memphis would become one of the hottest scenes in rap with a whole new generation of superstars. So in part two, we'll cover this new era of Memphis that took over the mainstream. So make sure you like this video, subscribe, and hit notifications so you don't miss it.